Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is obviously FASD Hub Scotland. Um, we are delighted that you have joined us for our monthly Wednesday webinars. Um, we've had some amazing guests over the last few months and tonight is no different. So tonight we have uh, Megan Tucker. Um, I was fortunate enough to have some training with Meg, um, meet her in person in Florida earlier this year. Um, she's been an inspiration to me and to my family and made an incredible difference to where we are today. So I was absolutely delighted to be able to get her to um, agree to come and be a guest for the Wednesday webinars at FAC Hub Scotland. So I am going to hand over to Meg and let her um, just give you a brief overview of herself, where she is, what she's done, her incredible um, journey to be the inspirational um, educator that she is today. And then this evening, she's going to be presenting to us um, FASD and harm reduction. So, hi Meg, thanks for joining us and over to you. Tell us all about yourself. All right, thank you. Oh, I'm happy to do this. Um, so, so I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, I live in rural Alberta in Canada. So I live um, kind of in a less populated area. So uh, I've ended up having to travel a lot, you know, cover a lot of ground in order to uh, work with a lot of people. And um, previously, so, so some of you might have read my bio, I used to work with the Lakeland Center for FASD, which was a leading agency in uh, advocacy and, and prevention uh, for FASD. And I spent 13 years there. I, uh, I created a transition to adulthood program for individuals with FASD. It was a pilot project when it started. And uh, so I had to do a research review, um, work with some researchers and, and figure out like, okay, has anything been done? No, no, nothing has been done. Uh, and so, so I had to design a one of a kind program specifically for uh, youth with FASD and how to help them make a plan for the future uh, when their brain doesn't always have the ability to see into the future. So it's a really unique program and it still exists today, which is exciting. So took it from a pilot project 13 years ago to a, a consistently funded project, which is really beautiful. I also spent a lot of years at the Lakeland Center doing prevention. We have a really, um, really great provincial prevention team where the province has worked with researchers to find what is the best way to do prevention work when we're dealing with alcohol and pregnancy. And so uh, I got to do that work and, and work with researchers and be trained by really, really amazing people like um, Dr. Nancy Poole. Uh, so so I've, I've been really fortunate to get a lot of training um, to really understand how do we do this work in the best way possible with you know the the best evidence behind us uh, but i i did leave the lakeland center for fasd last january and um since then i i also worked with um with jeff noble for a little while and now i'm actually working at the manawanis native friendship center manawanis is a um, cree word and it's a gathering place basically so um i'm working with the high risk populations, a lot of unhoused individuals, a lot of undiagnosed individuals who struggle to receive services, all of the individuals who are excluded from the ser services that exist um, due to a lot of factors, but FASD being one of the main ones and undiagnosed FASD. A lot of the individuals I've been working with um, don't have a their family anymore. A lot of their family has passed on and there's just no way to get alcohol confirmation. And so I've been doing a lot of programs uh, working in, in circle. So I'm, I'm also Métis, um, which is my, my ancestry is um, partially indigenous, uh, French, French and uh, 
and uh, indigenous. And so I've been doing a lot of circle. Circle is a um, traditional indigenous practice, which is really healing. And it's all about self-reflection, but also being heard where others are sitting and listening to you and hearing what's going on for you. And then you get to hear each of them in turn. And it actually really helps a lot of individuals with FASD to see that like their way of thinking isn't the only way. And that talking to people about our struggles um, can help us to not feel so um, suppressed by all of them, especially when we're talking about individuals who don't have a lot of support, who don't have families um, supporting them. So yeah, so that's what I've been doing lately and I'm um, really loving it. So yeah, so there you go. There's my little, <laughs> my little history of how I got to where I am. Um, I, I also have three children and um, one of my children had meningitis as an infant. And he, so that's like pressure on the brain. So he ended up with a lot of brain-based issues that were very similar to FASD. Um, so, so I have that at home lived experience uh, along with, you know, working directly with individuals and families, doing planning and, and educating around FASD for, for quite a while. So, so yeah. Okay. So let's get into this since we only have an hour. Um, so harm reduction, uh, I, I love harm reduction because, um, abstinence doesn't work for everybody and shame and blame definitely doesn't work for most people. So just a little kind of understanding of what harm reduction is. It's a practice used in the field of addictions primarily, and it works on the premise of reducing the harms caused by drugs or alcohol on individuals and society. So not only how does it affect them in their life and their family, but how is it affecting uh, everyone around them? And it takes into consideration uh, understanding trauma and adverse life experiences. And we know that individuals with FASD often have a lot of trauma mixed in uh, in their, their past simply because of people understanding their needs don't get uh, met and those getting their needs met. They end up the world because doing it right and so that because that's what pushes people away i'm not really um you know that's takes a lot of self-reflection and, and be hurtful to you already felt stood than to have people pointing a finger at you telling you you're bad over and over and that you should just um, get it together and you should just do this and that like it, it they end up really um, retreating and so that that's a lot of the people that I'm working with at the friendship center is a lot of people who've been shamed and blamed because they couldn't abstain and the reason they can't abstain is because they have so much pain, so much trauma, um, so many issues that they don't understand. And it's their coping mechanism, right? It's their, uh, it's their, their pain medication, basically they're experiencing pain. Um, so, so we know that this is common for individuals with FASD to experience that just because of the, the way the disability shows itself. Um, and it's about understanding that there's many issues and struggles of facing, which may be a behavior very difficult. Mm -hmm. So when I, so, so I, so harm reduction really is, uh, or came from substance, uh, the substance use kind of research, mm -hmm. but I also like to, um, use that model kind of as a broad umbrella with individuals with FASD. So looking at the, the, you know, they often get into harmful situations 
just because of the disability, because they don't know where the next uh, choice will lead them. They don't know uh, if it's a good idea or not. They are not able to see into the future. And so they end up in a lot of risky situations, not just related to drugs and alcohol, but related to a lot of things, including self-harm. And so I like to use the harm reduction model um, more broadly than just with substances. So, so now let's talk about like, yeah, why do individuals with FASD get into harmful situations? Uh, like I said, it's not just substances. It, I mean, substance use and misuse is common just because of those feelings of, I don't fit in, I'm not enough, I couldn't do it and everybody's mad at me. Um, and and so, so sometimes they turn to substances, but um, there's other reasons. So individuals with FASD are more likely to experience stress and stress response. So more things stress them. And that goes back to the brain. It goes back to that, like, they don't know what's coming next. They often have memory impairment. And so they can't rely on their memory to, to tell them if this is a good or bad situation, because they don't really remember. So now they don't know if this is a good idea from past experience. They also don't know if it's a good idea because they can't see in the future. And so they're stressed. They're, they can be stressed really easily by a lot of things that wouldn't stress most of us. So we have to recognize that, um, that, that, uh, sorry, I just have to turn my phone. There we go. Um, so yeah, so, so they're experiencing more stress and more stress response, right? Like, so going into fight, flight, freeze, they're going to do that more often um, because they, every situation is kind of like, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm safe. Right. Like, cause I don't know how to predict what's going to happen. And, and so then they just go into that um, stress response. Uh, and then other reasons are childhood adversity, right? Like, if they aren't diagnosed young and we don't know that FASD is the issue, they will experience a lot of adversity, right? A lot of people will be very frustrated with them. Um, and, you know, in some situations that can lead to abuse because it's so frustrating to understand why a child can't um, act their age, uh, you know? So, so. It, and I don't, I don't ever want to shame or blame parents. I know that it's really hard, especially in foster and, and adults. so challenging because we just don't know, um, you know, what these kids are bringing with them. And, and so there can be a lot in their history. And uh, yeah, so, so we have to understand that, that like, when you have a history of a lot of people being mad at you and not wanting to attach to you because of your behavior issues, we, and of course others would call them behavior issues, but I would call them symptoms of the disability, um, but that's how it's seen, right? Like that's a bad kid and I don't wanna um, be connected to that kid. And so that creates this feeling of loneliness and disconnection. And, and so that can lead to things like um, suicidal ideation and, and self-harm and substance misuse, right? Um, uh, individuals with FASD are really often victimized because of their dismaturity, because they don't have um, that, that good judgment, because to have good judgment, you have to, um, you have to be able to assess, you know, and, and you need that frontal lobe of your brain to be working really well, to be able to look at the, um, the unspoken things and the, the could be, and the, you know, so they're often, uh, not able to make really good decisions. And, and then they get victimized because somebody told them to do it. Somebody saw their vulnerability and their misunderstanding. And, and so they can kind of get pushed in, um, victimization pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um, they're often made fun of for their challenges because dismaturity is one of the challenges. And so, um, their peers will, will often make fun of them for not acting age appropriate. Um, and yeah, they're the behaviors that they're displaying that I said are symptoms of the disability are often misinterpreted by the world. They're often viewed as a bad kid, right? And so if you spend your life like that, um, it, it starts to make sense why 
they're just seeking and searching for who's going to love me and who's going to connect with me, who's going to be there for me. And when the healthy people in their lives are mad at them for their um, behaviors or symptoms, then, uh, then they go seek elsewhere. And so I see a lot of this where I'm working now is a lot of gang involvement, um, you know, cause they're looking for family and connection cause their family and connect and they're the people that they were connected to are all mad at them. Right. Um, and so, and then when we, when we bring that back to the brain there, there's often deficits interfering with their ability to problem solve, understand cause and effect, predict the outcomes, um, recognize danger and uh, choose safe friends, remembering what the outcome was, like I said, so, and, and they often can't, right. They just, it's like an automatic, they go into stress response. They don't, they, they're, their brain doesn't have the ability to be like, whoa, wait a minute. It's actually not that bad. We can get through this. Like their, their brain is just instantly going into, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I, I don't know what to do. I, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and so we see the dysregulation happen so much more often, um, which is, is frustrating, especially for caregivers who just really want to love their kids. And it feels like you can't, right? Because of life being so stressful for them. Um, so this is some 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 older research, but um, it gives us that tells us that story of why what's going on with the brain and why this individual gets into a lot of trouble because they look their age. They often can talk better than their age. Um, they can read okay, so they can kind of fly under the radar sometimes. Um, but then when we get down to the like real life skills, like being able to cook for yourself, being able to like clean your house and organize yourself and your time and your things, um, being able to budget and understanding time, getting places on time, um, understanding like social skills and, and how to interact with others in social situations those are at much younger levels, like a six or seven year old level. And so this is exactly why this individual is getting into really tricky, harmful situations so often, so easily because of this brain profile. Um, so there are some side effects to misunderstanding and uh, I, I don't want anybody to get depressed about this because because don't worry, we're going to come out the other side. But uh, here's what happens is after an individual is just constantly repetitively being reprimanded and yelled at for not doing it right, you're not listening, you're lazy, you're lying to me. Why didn't you? Why couldn't you? Right. Like this is a daily occurrence when they are when their disability is not understood and the, the 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 hard part is is like maybe maybe at home parents understand but then you go out into the community and the coach doesn't understand and the teacher doesn't understand and the principal doesn't understand and so even you know you can be trying your very best but you can still have a child who's experiencing these the constant negative feedback that is like you're not good enough and like you should be. So why can't you already, you know, like that's, that's the message they're hearing. And so that negative feedback really begins to wear on their self-esteem and their self-worth. And here's the tricky part. If your brain's missing something, how does your brain know it's missing it? Never had it. And, and so, so many individuals with FASD are really just doing the best that they can and they do not know why the world is mad at them. And they often get mad back and then it just makes it all worse. Cause they're just like, you're mean to me and I don't want to listen to you. And you're like, you need a consequence. And they're just like, F you. So, so this is the challenge is that um, we're, we're dealing with such a complex disability and it can create this scenario that really wears on that individual and and so it becomes 
to learn about their brain, to learn about their strengths, to learn about their struggles, and then to be really good advocates with those who aren't understanding. Oh, here, there we go. So, um, <clears throat> So what does lack of connection look like? Because now after I've explained all that, you, you can start to make sense of that um, these individuals are really not, con not no one's connecting with them, right? So uh, when kids are seeking connection and hitting walls at every turn, they're going to look for ways to fill that need. Um, they might, it might look like hanging out with a bad crowd. We see that really often. And it starts in adolescence where they're, they're just like, nobody gets me. My family hates me. Um, and, and there is, there's like a bad crowd, you know, like the, the other kids who are also experiencing that and they're upset about it and they're rebelling. Um, and, and so often our kids with FASD will join those crowds, um, cause that's where they're accepted. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're just, they might be searching the internet for friends or, or pornography or, you know, and, and so they can get themselves into a lot of trouble that way. And really it's because of lack of connection, um, and uh, that, you know, experimentation with substances. If, if you feel really lonely in the world, um, substances can turn that off. Um, and, or we might see new mental health issues start showing up, uh, you know, like we might see more anxiety or anxiety that wasn't there before. They don't want to go to school anymore because everybody's mean and they're always in trouble. Um, and then that's where it starts to get into, well, what's the point? I guess nobody wants me. Um, and so we get into self-harm and suicidal ideation, which is scary when you're a caregiver and you... You just want your child to have a good life. So, so we have to know this, like, um, it, it, you know, this, it, it comes from a place and youth are seeking to fill needs that they can't always verbalize. They can't always tell us, right? They're, that brain is struggling and they don't know how or why their brain is struggling. They're just trying to make sense of the world. It, it doesn't make sense why everyone's mad at them and, and everyone's mean and giving them these mean consequences because they don't remember doing the bad thing or they don't think it was that bad because they, they they don't, their brain just can't see the full picture, right? Like that's all abstract. Um, and and so, yeah, they're, they just can't tell us. Um, yeah. Um, we need to be interested in what they're wanting to do and anything that they're curious about. So like, let's be curious with them. So one of the best or first things I tell caregivers to do with harm reduction is to um, stop demonizing things that they're doing, right? Like if, if we're coming from this abstinence mindset, so let's say your kid gets in trouble for vaping or smoking at school. And you're just like, oh my God, that's so bad for you. I can't believe you did that. And you know better. And 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 we're just pointing and shaming and blaming. And and we're and and they're just like, this doesn't make any sense because this thing's helping me. So screw you. I don't want to talk to you anymore. That that's what happens in their own mind. Cause you're you're now just like losing it about something that they find helpful. And so the reason I want you to be curious is because we wanna know what is it doing for them? We wanna know, uh, like, why is it interesting to you? Because if we can figure out why and what's underneath it, we can help them to replace it with something healthier, but we don't have to do that immediately, right? And so this is the thing about harm reduction. It's a little bit hard to get on board with uh, sometimes because most of us as parents were just like, you can't smoke. No, no way ever. Um, but the thing with FASD is they, they don't understand why we're saying no. And they, they can't see the, the depths of all of everything that's underneath it. Like, uh, it, it's too much, right? It's too, there's too much to understand there. And so, um, they're just like, well, I want to do it and it helps me. So screw you. I'm going to run away now. 
And, and so now we're in kind of more trouble because now we're dealing with a kid who's running away and getting into more harmful situations because we came in with an abstinence, shame and blame approach. So this is why I say, get curious, get to know them and their struggles to say, Hey, I'm on your team. And I want to know what, what about this is helping you? I, I want to understand how it's helping you because I'm here for you, right? So the message is we need to be from instead of you're bad, you shouldn't have, right? Um, so yeah, so we want to have conversations about, about the activity and the safety of it. Um, and, and so that's where we can talk about a harm reduction plan where we can say, I want you to be safe. Um, so what do you think, what can we do to help you stay the safest? Right. And so, you know, like instead of running away to go find, um, a vape to, to like buy off someone in a weird back alley, that's a little scary, right? Instead of that, let's talk about it and let's talk about what it does for you. And then let's talk about if we can, um, use a harm reduction model. And so a harm reduction model would be that, okay, so you have this vape now. Um, if you feel like you need it, come and tell me and I'll, I'll let you have it. But how about you give it back to me in between so that I keep it in a safe place so that you don't get in trouble at school, right? Like, so we can kind of make a plan where we're like, okay, like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I don't think it's the greatest, but I also want you to feel good in the world. And so I want to make sure that we have a plan where you feel okay and you're safe, right? So it's not necessarily agreeing. You're not saying oh, that substance is good. You're saying, I don't want you in harm's way. And so I'll allow a little bit of it so that we can work together. So that's kind of how that is. Um, and cause really youth, they want to be the master of their own lives and they want to find ways to assert their independence, but youth with FASD, we know that poor decision-making is common because they can't see into the future. And so this is where we need to foster interdependence where like they can have some independence, but it's as a team, we're working together and, and we're problem solving together and we're making safety plans together because, um, because you're on the same team and you care about them, right? And so so we instead of coming in with the lecture that they're they're gonna glaze over, we're coming in with the, I love you and I care about you and I wanna stay connected to you and I want you to stay safe. Um, and so we can also, foster independence by allowing them to be part of the decision making in these areas right so by having a harm reduction conversation you're allowing them to still have some control in their life and that's what they're really seeking because they're feeling like you know everybody tells me what to do and I can't do it and everybody's mad at me and and they're just trying to find a way to cope right and so as soon as we open the door to hearing them and being curious about what's going on for them, we can open the door to conversations about healthier coping mechanisms. Uh, and so it might start with, okay, I'm going to let you use that vape, but Hey, do you want to go for a walk? Like, Hey, let's do, let's do a vape walk, you know, like I'll, I'll let's, and, and let, and then like, let's talk about how you feel after the walk. Right. And, Let's start to do a little bit of self-reflection, not too much. We don't overwhelm them, but just a little bit of, oh, I found that walk really helpful. How did you find it? You know, how are you feeling? Um, because they, they often don't do that on their own. But if, if we're with them, we can kind of guide them and model this self-reflection and the, oh yeah, I did like that. Okay, well, let's plan one for tomorrow night. I'm here for you. Walking is one of the best things you can do. Rhythmic, repetitive movements are therapeutic to the brain. So walking is not only going to help them with their stress response, um, but it, it also helps them to not be in uh, like anxiety. And, and, and so it helps them to be able to talk to you. So this is, we're, we're fostering connection and, and relationship uh, because connection is a basic human need. We absolutely all need it. 
And we don't always think about it, but we're wired for connection. And, and so this is why individuals with FASD are searching and they feel so disconnected because of the, those brain-based disabilities and because there's many different disabilities that others don't understand. Um, you know, they, they usually are not connected in a lot of ways. And uh, if, if we don't create that connection within our homes, they will go outside and we will have them running away. And it, it, it I tell you, it doesn't end well. Um, cause there are, uh, there's some clients I worked with previously that I now are, I'm seeing on the streets and it was because that connection piece didn't happen, um, with their caregivers. And so especially it's a lot that have aged out of foster care. Um, and so they don't have connections with their family and they don't have connections with their foster family. Uh, and so they are on the streets and, um, in really unsafe situations. So, so that's. That's my mission is to prevent that because everybody deserves to be loved. Um, we all need that. So one of the things, the, the, the way that I really like to um, help people understand is this is some, um, this is from Reclaiming Youth at Risk. So you can see in the bottom corner of my slide, uh, Larry K. Brentro, Martin Brokenleg, which is now Dr. Martin Brokenleg, and uh, Steve Van Bockern. And they, it's a, it's a wonderful book, Reclaiming Youth at Risk, I recommend it. In that book, they have this really um, wonderful chart that explains what happens with, within us, okay? So I'm gonna tell you um, connection, it starts within us. And I know a lot of the time we wanna point at our kid and say, oh, he's, it's him that's disconnected from me. Um, but I'm going to explain this chart. So it us in the way we think, if we are thinking with demeaning labels, if we, we are thinking that their behavior is attributed to negative traits within them, um, then, then we think that they are inferior. We, we look at them, we look down on them. We think that they're incapable and they can't, uh, do it on their own. Right. So when we think that way, it affects the way we are, our affect, right? The way we um, kind of are feeling about them. And so we will feel repulsed by them and apathy, like I don't even want to try. And, and so then what happens? happens it, it that converts to the action of avoidance and neglect. We're just like, I'm done with that kid. I keep him away from me. Um, and, and also if, if we're thinking that their behavior is intentional deviance, we're like, oh, they're disrespectful. Oh, they just like, they 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 just want to bug everybody and, and get in the way and disturb and, and uh, they just don't care. They just aren't trying hard enough. Right. And so when we think that way, um, we, we get angry on the inside, uh, and, and distressed, right. We start to feel like to do with this kid and so what do we do we punish them we try to coerce them um, a lot of bribery <laughs> uh, yeah and those things are the things that push people away um, so so this is within our own minds we create disconnection depending on how we view our child so what, what can this lead to individuals with FASD often mirror our emotions? They don't know what's going on in the world. So they're looking to us to figure it out. And if our negative thoughts lead to negative feelings and actions, then the individual is likely going to mirror that. They're going to be more of what we think they are, the bad kid. And we don't even realize that that. It's, it's like a, a cycle. We, it started in our head, which we don't even know. So don't shame or blame yourself, but it happens to all of us. And it's, you know, a consequence of our society. Um, we fabricate what we've created. We don't even realize that we're making it worse for them. And this leads to further disconnection. So what can we do? It starts with us. 
we can change the way we about them. We have to really look at ourselves and look at our thoughts and then say to ourselves, oh yeah, I'm mad at that kid. Oh yeah. And like, he did a lot of things that made me mad, but he has a disability and I need to be the one who looks beyond the behavior, right? Okay. So, so it takes a little bit because we might be mad from a lot of things that happen, but we have to remember they have a terrible memory um, and terrible foresight. And so um, they're not, they're, they're just like in survival moment to moment, trying to figure it out and reciprocating what others are showing them. Right. And so if we change our thinking, if we um, use esteeming labels and we think of them as, you know, what, even though they've done bad things, they are still worthy. They are still competent. They're still strong. Then we start to change the way we feel about them. Then we want to be around them, right? The moment we start to say, you know what? This kid is worth my time. It it actually changes the way we feel. Cool, right? Um, so, so therapy for caregivers can be really helpful if we can um, do that work of, I need to look at them differently. I need to stop holding a grudge for their disability. And I need to start seeing that, you know what? Um, I do, I do love my child and I do want the best for them. So I'm going to think differently. Um, then we're attracted to them. We have affection for them. We're, and then our actions are to nurture and empower. And this is how we turn it around. This is how, when we're nurturing, empowering, um, then, then they mirror that. And now they want to connect with us. Right. Um, and, it, and, you know, maybe it might be hard to, to switch to esteeming labels right off the bat we can switch to empathizing labels. We can say, you know what? My poor kid has been rejected. He's frustrated. He's so discouraged and I get it. And that's hard to live a life, to be completely misunderstood by the world because you have a hidden disability. It's unfair. And as soon as we start to think that way, now we have concern, now we have sympathy. And so our actions are to befriend and encourage I'm here for you. I'm curious about what's going on for you, right? I love you. I want the best for you. I'm on your team. This is how it starts because we know that they are mirroring us. This is how we make changes. It starts within us and it's not always easy because I know that you guys have probably gone through some really difficult scenarios with your kids and, and, lots of people not understanding but I hope that this gives you hope that um, you know just assessing your own thought process can can make a huge difference in their feelings about the world and and their connection to you so um, I recommend that we use a strength-based approach we really need to look at um, what what can they do instead of what can't they, right? We spend a lot of time noticing their deficits and being mad about their deficits. And so we have to get intentional about acceptance. You know what? My child does have a disability. It's pretty severe and I'm working to understand it, right? And so <clears throat> I wanna, uh, you know, to say to yourself, like, I wanna find their gifts. I wanna find their strengths. That's where we need to focus our energy because yes, those deficits are there and they're always going to be there and let's set up those supports. Absolutely. Right. We are going to advocate to that school. We are going to get them that extra support because they need it. Let's, let's look at what are they good at? What are the gifts they bring to this world? Because everybody has a purpose. I believe we're all meant to be here. We all have something to share. And I know that I have learned a lot from people with FASD. They have taught me so much patience, so much compassion, so much understanding. And, and I know that they are here for a reason to change the way we look at the world. Instead of judging people who struggle, we need to look deeper and look for, you know what, if, if they don't have any strengths that are being shown because they're in that really deep, dark hole already, then let's look for interest. 
What do they like? What do they want to know more about? How can we engage them? Is it through music? Is it through video games? Like we just want to get on the same page as them with something and encourage them to learn more about it. Even if it's video games, <laughs> like, you know, I know a lot of people struggle with that, but you know, for some kids that that's their, their space where they feel okay. Um, and, and yeah, maybe we don't want them to do it 24 hours a day, but um, let's encourage them to learn more and, and, oh, like, let's watch this YouTube video or, or something, right? Like be interested with them in their interests. That's how we engage them. And that's how we bring them back to us to connect to us so that they can show us the talents in their brain. Because from what I've learned about FASD over all these years is that there are still good parts of the brain. There are parts that developed really well and we need to find those and sometimes they're lost under all the deficits but they're there and so we just want to create opportunities for finding their gifts right like asking them oh do you want to try that I'll do it with you right because sometimes trying new things creates anxiety but but if you are there with them that can help right we also want to search for possibilities within the community where they can participate and contribute even if it's setting up some chairs at a local event and then and then just like praising them so much after like, oh, wow, that was so helpful. I'm so glad you came out for the community and, um, you know, even even getting one of your friends to also praise them can be really helpful and, and help them to feel like, oh, I'm a part of something and I'm wanted. Uh, that's huge. So there are a lot of benefits to using a strength-based approach we need um recognized we all we all want to be seen we all want to feel our inherent value and worth because we are all valuable we are all worthy we're here we're, we're you know we're here for something and so um yeah it, it being recognized for your strengths helps you to develop self-confidence um and you know, contributing to the community makes it, it just encourages positive interactions. We create a positive cycle. I'm all about circle, right? Reciprocity. The more good we do, the more good that comes by people being appreciative. And so if we can foster that in someone who is risking disconnection, we can turn their life around. Um, and it also helps prevent substance abuse, right? If they are feeling heard and loved and connected, they don't need to numb. They don't need to turn it off, right? Um, and, and it helps them to build resilience because now they have this good solid foundation of I can do it and I have people telling me I can. And so even when it gets tough, um, that, that they, so like I said, there's memory deficits, but at the same time, if they have um, intense emotional uh, reaction, they often will remember. And so those really positive experiences in their life, they will remember that. And that builds resilience. Uh, when they feel really loved and connected, that they, they remember that. And I have a lot of clients that I worked with who would tell me that, you know, like, I don't remember a lot, but I remember when my auntie took me to this thing and I was able to do that. And and, you know, so, so it's not that they can't remember, it's that um, there's just so much going on in their brain, a lot of things seem unimportant. Uh, but if there's a strong emotional attachment, they're, they're likely going to remember. And it builds their self-esteem. So, so what we need to do is we need to be fostering connection, right? And this is, this is like the best thing you can do for harm reduction actually right so so <laughs> it's it's funny like it, you, we can spend a lot of time doing like okay you can smoke a little or you can or okay if you're gonna if you're trying to go use meth let's let's go down to weed you know like there th those are some really concrete ways of doing harm reduction where it's like oh you're in some really harmful stuff we're gonna lower that harm right like that that's part of it but actually connection is the most beautiful harm reduction strategy that you will ever use because it often helps them to not need other things right 
Um, and, and so that's the thing we want to foster the most. But absolutely, if you've got a kid who is, you know, running away to use a whole bunch of substances to escape from everybody being mad at them, then we start with baby steps. We start with, I care about you. I love you. Can I take you for lunch? Um, and, and then, and then to be interested, you know, like, oh, I, I heard that you've been, um, skipping class and I just want to know what's going on for you, you know, and, and like not too many words and not too complicated and absolutely no lecturing is all about the questions and about the, like affirming I'm on your team. I care about you. I want the best for you. I want to help your life be the best it can be. And I know it's hard sometimes to have those conversations when we're stuck in the loop of toxicity where it's like, he did that and that and that, and then he came at me and then he yelled and sweared and then he threw the thing. And, and so we're just like mad on top of mad on top of mad. And so that's where it starts with us starts with us taking that deep breath in that moment of solitude to say, okay, my kid is struggling. It's not my fault. It's not his fault. And I want to be on his team. And so I'm, I'm going to let go of the shit. <laughs> I'm going to let go. <laughs> and that's hard. I know, believe me, I know. Um, but I just, I just really want you guys to understand that if we connect with them, we are eliminating a lot of problems because they feel valuable. They feel worthy. And now they're interested in life and now they're interested in trying new things. Whereas when everybody's mad and they're always in trouble, they're just like, screw it. I'm not doing anything. I don't want any of it. Right. And, and so this is what we're working on is flipping it around. And uh, yeah, so the things we can do to foster connection is show love in really obvious, ridiculous ways, like really obvious, um, because they're, they're not very abstract. They're not going to pick up on it. Right. So, um, you, you want to be intentional about, oh, here, I did this for you because I love you. Here you go. Really care about you. You know, like, like, let's try to really incorporate more of that into the daily, daily life. Right. Is like, I love you. I care about you. You're important to me. You're important to the world, you know, and, and it might not always feel like it when your friends are upset with you and your teachers are upset with you, but no matter what, I'm here for you. And I love you, right? Like those kinds of things really, really help them. Um, and search for small, every teeny opportunity to praise. Like they put the wrapper in the garbage, which they never do. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> That's so great. You know, like the smallest things, um, even arranging friendships. Oh, if you like as young as possible, set it up, be present, you know, like have coffee with the other mom, make sure that the two of them are playing in a close by room so that the moment you hear a, Hey, you go, Oh, Hey, what's going on guys. <laughs> oh, Hey, right. We need to intervene right away to guide them through their friendships. Cause they do not get social skills. They're not going to get it on their own. They're not going to learn from the kid getting mad at them. They're just going to be like, that kid got mad at me. So I punched him <laughs> it's like, you know, um, so, so yeah, so we want to make sure that we're assisting them with friendships wherever possible, helping them through it. Even, you know, if they come home and say, oh, my friend's mad at me, Hey, invite your friend for supper and let's all have a talk, you know? And like, let's sit down and say, Hey, I, I hear you guys are fighting and I'm really sad about that. Cause you guys have such a great friendship. And so I just want to hear about it and see if I can help. Right. Like just you know even if they're teenagers they sometimes we can do that the other thing we can do is we can actually educate their peers about FASD um, and and about brain difference you don't even have to call it FASD you can just say we all have different brains and some of us have brains that have a lot of strengths and some of us have brains that have you know, a few really good strengths and, and, but we also have a lot of challenges, you know, and some of us have more challenges than others. And, and like, let's talk about that. Right. 
So I recommend circle in classrooms. So, so where you would all sit in circle with all the kids and then you would talk about brain difference and then you would ask each of them, go around the circle and ask each of them to tell you about, um, you know, a struggle that they have and a strength that they have so that we can all be honest about that. Nobody's perfect. So stop being so mad, mad, right? Like, yeah. Um, and supervision as much as possible. It just helps avoid conflict and problems. So the other thing we can do is view all behaviors as messages from the brain. Uh, we want to pay attention to the situation and try to prevent any antecedents or, or if we see the antecedents, we prevent the problem. Uh, and I know that's not always easy, but you kind of have to get yourself into this headspace of, okay, my child is going to have some dismaturity for a long, long time. And so I'm going to be present as if they were still a toddler so that uh, they have the support they need, right? So we have to tell ourselves that because otherwise we just get mad about it. We're like, oh, oh my God, I have to be there and I, I have all these other things to do. And it's like, no, nope, no, nope, you have a different child than you expected. And that there's a grieving process there. That's a whole other training. Um, there's a grieving process there, but um, it's not the child that we expected. It's the child that we have with a brain difference. And so we do need to do things differently. Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, take some time with yourself, do some meditating, get yourself to a calm place so that you can start to look at the situation with those empathetic thoughts rather than the like, I'm mad at those behaviors kind of thoughts. Um, yeah. So we just want to come from that place of understanding that they may lack the ability to communicate. And, and so we just need to be more present, right? And really important, let's teach and model alternate forms of expression because they don't know what's going on inside and why it feels bad. And so we need to teach them really intentionally by showing them and taking part in it, right? They need to see it or else it's scary. Um, things like art therapy and music therapy and animal therapy, you know, and, and teaching them and, and animal therapy can teach mindfulness because mindfulness can be hard to teach to, uh, to, to people with brain difference, but animal therapy is a really good way to just get in that moment. Um, and journaling. And here's the thing about FASD in the brain. They, it, they can get really perseverative and stuck on things. And so I wouldn't want to spend too much time journaling negatives because that just hurts more every time they open the book and reread it and think about it. And so I encourage journaling the positives, doing gratitude journals, um, you know, and doing it together, talking about what was the best part of your day? Um, you know, did you feel really good today? Let's, let's write about that. Uh, or, you know, even the small things, you know, like, even though you had a bad day, can you think of any small good things, right? So just really encouraging more positive self-talk, positive thoughts, uh, because it is hard when you're constantly looked down on and talked about and in trouble and, and the finger gets wagged, you know? So yeah, we want, we want to be intentional about positivity. So our role as caregivers is understanding that the brain difference is at the core of all of these issues, right? So there's a lot, there's a lot of different brain issues. I didn't even cover them all, right? You know, um, but here in Canada, we're testing 11 brain domains. And so, yeah, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of possible um, struggles. And, and so we need to understand those really well understand where support is needed as a prevention mechanism, um, but also really looking for those strengths. We need to acknowledge the need for co-regulation, right? That we have a child who is likely experiencing a lot of emotional dysregulation. They can't regulate their emotions. And so we need to co-regulate. We need to be the calm one. We need to be the one who says, oh yeah, that's stressful. Let's take a deep breath. 
let's take a walk, let's turn on some music, right? So we're going to be that one, that person who models how can we regulate, how can we get through this? Uh, and then, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is match our expectation to their developmental ability. Here's the tricky part. Each day is a new day with a FASD brain. And so some days their brain is mentally exhausted from whatever happened in the beginning of the week. You know, they were, a lot was asked of them and they're really tired. Like mental exhaustion is a thing for, for kids with FASD and adults with FASD. And so um, we just need to recognize that, that some days are going to be bad brain days and let's not be mad about it. Let's be understanding and say, okay, what do you feel like you can do today? Do you need to go for a walk first? Let's drink some water. You know, our bodies are mostly water. So you might be dehydrated, right? Like let's give them some really practical solutions for the waking up dysregulated, right? They're just like, oh, I can't. And you're like, okay, I get it. Um, you know, close your eyes. I'll turn on a guided meditation. I'm going to go get you some water, right? Like we can actually help them to see that that the, their brain different difference affects them differently every day and that uh, we're there to to show up to help them um and teach them skills with repetition and consistency repetition and consistency are the best two things you can do for their brain the more we do it the easier it becomes for them and the more that we're consistent then they start to be able to know that they're safe with us. It takes time. It, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> but um, when they get to that place of knowing we're safe because we haven't lost it on them, because we dealt with our own frustrations about the disability, uh, that's where connection really starts to happen, right? So, so there's a little bit of self-work that happens on our part in order to get to that place where we can be really good at co-regulating and connecting and being consistent, but that's, that's where we see the best results. Um, and, and it's tough because sometimes they get dysregulated at the drop of a hat and you don't even know what caused it, but that's where if we're meditating and walking regularly, if we're journaling regularly, if we're caring for ourselves, then we're more able to handle those moments where they're, they like, wow. And you're like, it's okay. It's okay. I'm here for you. Take a breath. You want to go for a walk, right? Like, and that might not be possible instantly. You might say, take a breath and they might say F you. <laughs> and so in those moments, you're like, okay, I see that you need some space. Uh, you know, do you want me to come back or you come, come get me when you're ready. Right. So you, you try different things, try different ways of saying give you a minute and I'll come back and check and if they're like no okay all right I won't come check you you come see me when you're ready right we just have to try our very best to help them calm down and if it's us that's true sometimes it can be um then we remove ourselves from that situation as long as they're safe right like okay you stay and uh and 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 I'll go have a timeout because I feel like I'm part of the problem and I don't want to be because I love you Right. And so we're just like staying really calm, the least words as possible. And we're just helping them to regulate so they can make it through. Cause the moment we, if they're dysregulated and they're just at this, like, ah, and we come at them with, you can't talk to me like that. They're going to mirror us. Right. And so now we're going to be in the biggest dysregulated fight you've ever been in. And so this is why we have to stay calm, right? We have to be the one who is like, it's okay. You know, instead of reacting to their dysregulation, we have to um, respond with love and compassion for the brain struggle they are experiencing because that's what it is. Um, and the team approach, you know, we're going to solve this together. I'm here for you. Um, that's one of the best things that you can do. So um, here's just, this is also from that book, Reclaiming uh, Youth at Risk. And, and the Circle of Courage is Dr. Martin Brokenleg. I encourage you to look him up. 
Um, he's uh, Indigenous, he's Lakota from the US, and just a really good, balanced, holistic way for dealing with um, youth that are struggling. And, and so, yeah, so basically, it's people want to achieve their goals, right? Um, and people want to be part of, they want to belong. And, and so we, we need to foster these kinds of help our young people feel complete, to feel a part of something, you know? And uh, generosity is such a great way to, to turn things around, right? To have them show up for others. They can start to feel good about themselves um, for contributing. And then, you know, having some places where they can demonstrate responsibility, where they can be the one who chooses, that is also really helpful. So I encourage you to find um, to, to allow some of that in with safety. So there we go. Oh, there we go. And there's some references and resources. Fantastic. Um, can you stop sharing screen? Yeah. Ah, so we're all back to Oh, normal now. So I just want to say amazing, fantastic, brilliant. Uh, there are a couple of questions, Meg, that I just would like to, uh, I know we're like right on the bullet of you leaving, but there was, um, there's a, a question um, which says, um, and I hope you can answer this. It seems to me that this is a hopeful approach um, and it's fundamental to creating a better future. If this for any reason is not in place by the time our loved ones transition to adulthood, what can be done then? So I'm guessing this is probably a parent or caregiver who's, whose child has already transitioned to adulthood mm -hmm. and you know, what can they do if all the things that you're offering are hugely beneficial, but maybe they're going down the route of criminal justice or routes that are not really what any of us would want as families? How how do they um, manage that? Yeah, so um, the, the really cool thing about FASD, <laughs> I don't know if it's really cool, but it's really interesting um, there's there's a big window for transitionhood, so they can be you know in their late twenties. They still need that support in transit. They still aren't able to figure it out on their own, right? And so um, it's it, it, sort of like a perpetual teenager, right? That dismaturity. And yeah. so, so we have continued opportunities all throughout their life. And it really comes back to our approach, right? Instead of coming at them with, why did you, why couldn't you, you said you were going to, um, we, we have to do the same thing and it might take a little bit longer, but we're going to approach them with, I love you. I'm on your team. I want to help you. Can we sit down and talk about it? Right. And so just creating space for it's okay that you screwed up. It's okay that you're in trouble. I'm still here for you. And just them hearing that often will open them up to, okay, yeah, yeah, I do need your help. Um, and, and so really getting them to a place of accepting that, we, we might need help at, at any age. And so I used to work with youth. I, I did work with youth all the way into their late twenties. Um, and, and I helped them create transition plans based on where they were at. Right. And, and it starts with, Hey, I want you to have the best future possible. Uh, and so I'm here for you. So let's talk. Yeah. And, and it's actually a little bit easier when they're older because sometimes um, there's parts of their cognition that do get a little bit better. 
So it's okay that they're older. Yeah, okay. And somebody else, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep you too long. So if you want to go, that's fine. But there was there was another there was another comment. Um, somebody posted, my stepson steals food even, even after having meals. He also puts anything and everything in his mouth. Mm hmm. Yeah. So um, he like he probably needs something to put in his mouth. He's he, like it's a sensory issue. And so I know I know that we were like, oh, but that's a baby issue. And uh, let's just like disregard age and normal normalcy. Let's just disregard that and look at it for what it is. He's having a sensory issue. So let's find him something a little bit more age appropriate that he can be soothing that sensory need um and and could even say to him hey like what do you want to try um do you and you know like uh, thinking about those lollipops yeah. but that's a lot of sugar <laughs> right so yeah. if you find some healthy lollipops um but i would encourage the conversation about hey let's find something that helps you uh and and also like maybe we lock up the food <laughs> you know yeah, lock, up yeah, some that. lock up the food for that way <laughs> yeah. and and then let's talk about what what um what could you do right like I I and you can say I see that you um often need to have something in your mouth and that's okay let's let's talk about what's a good thing right I don't want you to have anything dangerous in there um so so like let's just matter of fact it it's okay I'm not mad at you and and let's meet the need that's that's what it's about meeting needs so I've got a question tonight somebody's asked me does Megan offer one-to-one -one service for caregivers <laughs> well I uh, I did start my own business called interconnectedness um and and so I yeah I can do that um I I currently have like I never put it out there because I'm really busy already but um yeah if you want to send me and also email. you know we we're at the FSD Hub Scotland so we're like everybody come here but you know for me I I've had a lot of training and worked with like work learned a lot from you Meg and that's how you're here today because you made such a huge difference to my family and my life and um I'm eternally grateful um and have gained so 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 much um so I just want to say thank you I just want to say thank you for joining us tonight um there are so many com comments thank you so much for tonight Megan such a realistic everyday approach to learning how to be more understanding towards our children so helpful there are some great comments coming in. Um, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time from the other side of the world and um, joining us tonight. But I'm eternally grateful to have met you myself as a parent and caregiver and so thankful that you've been able to bring your um, expertise and your um, knowledge of FASD to Europe Scotland, England, <laughs> all of us people on the other side of the world. Um, yeah. I thank you so much because I know it's like a huge thing. You know, the time schedules are, are, are difficult for us all, but I, I really, really thank you for your time tonight. It's been amazing. Um, the presentation was brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, I hope we can invite you back in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know that it's part of my purpose in this world is I have my own brain difference. I have ADHD and, uh, and, but my gift is I'm able to understand and then explain my, yeah. I have a, my verbal ability. That's my gift. And so I I'm happy to share it because um, that's what, that's what gifts are for. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, and we'll see you all soon at our next webinar. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye.